Hello there. New things. You know, we start new things all the time. Some are bigger than others. And God has given us new days, new weeks, new months and new years and new decades to reset and rethink. In the Bible, it says that God's mercies are new every morning. And we're told that uh, seed time and harvest will always remain. God has put seasons and new starts in place for a reason, but we need to take his approach to new things. Today, I want to look at Joshua and the children of Israel going into the promised land and how God wants us to approach new things. In Joshua chapter 1, it starts off by saying, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. Can you imagine the scene? They've had 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They know the promises of God. God had promised the exact boundaries and delimitations of this new land to them. They knew exactly what to expect, but they also knew there were giants. And the previous time they had tried to go in, they had failed. There was the 40 years of wandering with failures and amazing, miraculous moves of God in their past. And now they're standing on the edge of the Jordan. It's three days until they go in. And the first thing that God says to Joshua is Moses is dead. And the first thing we need to understand is that we need to look forward and not backward. Someone has said that it's a bit like a rear view mirror in a car when you're driving along. It's useful every now and again to glance back to see mistakes you've made, but also the way God has guided you and helped you just to remember and learn from. But most of the time we have to be looking forwards. My friend, are you looking forward into your new thing? You know, what's ahead is better than what's behind. A great friend of mine, Rob McFarlane, says the best is yet to come. That's what he always says. And I want to tell you that that is biblical. The Bible says that of the increase of God's kingdom and peace, there will be no end. The path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter to the new day. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. These are verses in the Bible that show that God's plan for you and me is a good, pleasing and perfect plan. And we should look ahead and not backwards. God says to Joshua, Moses is dead. Why did he have to say that? Joshua knew that. But God was telling him because he wanted him to realize one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and pressing forward to what is ahead. That is what Joshua had to do. And I'm asking you as you start this new thing that you're going into, a new season, would you please just trust God for the past? You say, how do I do that, Greg? Well, you put it under his blood. You say, Lord, the mistakes that I've made, thank you that your blood is enough to wash me and to forgive those sins. And Lord, all the things that were done to me, I put them under your blood. I release them to you. You are the judge and not me. And Lord, even the good things that I've done in the past that I like to remember and live in the glow of the past. Lord, I put those under your blood and I say, I am what I am by the grace of God. It was you. And now, Lord, would you keep your promise of working all those things together for good? Because I love you. That's Romans 8, 28. And as we do that, we're ready to start moving forward. But then he says, uh, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. God delimits the territory of the promised land. And he says, every place your foot will tread, I have given to you. The promised land is called the promised land because it is defined by the promises of God. And that sounds very simple, but I want to say to you, it is profound. My friend, the place you are walking into, the relationships you're walking into, 
the blessing that you're walking into, the job that God has for you that you're walking into, all the experiences of this next season are delimited by the promises of God. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. He says, as I spoke to Moses, I'm speaking to you. The promises that God gave to other people are relevant for us. You say, Greg, how can that be? In normal everyday life, that's not the case. If somebody makes a promise to my friend, it doesn't necessarily apply to me. But in Christ, it's different. Do you remember the lady, the Syrophoenician lady who came to Jesus? Her daughter was oppressed by a demon. And Jesus said, I was just sent to the lost children of Israel. She said, um, yes, but even the crumbs that fall off the table when you're feeding the children, the dogs can eat them up. She said, yes, but I know in you the promises reside. Even though they were for Israel, they, they can apply to me. And Jesus said, your faith, your faith, you, you have the answer that you wanted because of your faith. You took the promises and you understood that in Christ, all of God's promises are yes. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. We say amen. We take God's promises. Now, my question to you, my dear friend, is as you're going into this new season, what delimits, what describes this new thing for you? Is it what your eyes can see, what your ears can hear, what others have told you? Is it your fears or your expectations of, of worry and bad things to come? Or are you focusing on the boundaries that God has described in his promises? You say, Greg, how do I get these promises? We read God's word. We say, Lord, what was your promise to King David, to Isaiah, to Peter, to Joseph, to whomever it is. Lord, what can I see of your character, of your will for me and for people? And Lord, in Christ, I understand that all of your promises are yes. And I say, Amen. And I take that promise. I can remember as a young Christian, I walked into a living room and Christian TV program was on the TV. And a man was speaking about a promise from Luke, where Jesus said, uh, you don't have to worry about what you're going to say because I will give you words and wisdom that no one can resist or contradict. And I just heard a few minutes of that sermon, but it lodged in my heart and I understood that was a promise. That's a promise by Jesus and I can take it. And I can honestly say that promise has guided my life every day since then. For the last 30 years, I have relied on God and I've said, Lord, give me words and wisdom that no one can resist or contradict. And he has come through and I could name hundreds of promises. And my question to you is, are you going into a natural future or are you going into your promised land? Find promises, find promises every day. Look in God's word and say, Lord, what is your character? What is your will? What are you promising to others? And how in Christ does that apply to me and take the promises and rely on them and say, this is what we're going into. So the second important principle is to base your new season, your new thing on the promises of God. Find the promises of God. You know, you can use a concordance or a Bible program or even a search engine on the Internet and say, a Bible promise about, and you can find the promises of God. You can read through the scriptures systematically, and you can find the promises of God. And I want to promise you, God's promises will never fail. They are exceedingly great and precious, we're told in 2 Peter 1. God has promises for you. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he promised and he will not do? That's what the Bible tells us. And God wants to keep his promises, find his promises, rely on them. It will help you. The Israelites could not have done what they did in their own strength. It had to be by God. He then goes on to say in, in verse six, be strong and of good courage for to this people, you shall divide as an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them only be strong and very courageous 
that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The need for courage is reiterated again and again in these verses. He says, be strong, have courage. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Have courage, be strong, have courage, have courage, have courage. It is necessary, my dear friends, for you and I to take a step of faith. You remember the story of Peter sitting on the boat. It's in the middle of the night. It's dark. The sea is stormy. The wind and waves are bashing the boat. And they see Jesus walking on the water toward them. Jesus had been on the shore. They had put out, put out to sea. And in the middle of the night, they were struggling in the storm. They saw Jesus, but they weren't sure because it was nighttime and it was stormy. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus just says one word. He says, come. And on the basis of that one word, on that promise of Jesus, Peter had courage. He ignored the fact that the other 11 disciples were too afraid. He ignored the fact that usually humans cannot walk on water. He ignored the wind and the waves and he gathered up his courage. He told his leg muscles, his arm muscles, his body to jump out of the boat, to climb out. And he used his own legs and muscles to walk on the water. Friends, that is what faith is all about. It's a step of courage. Some people have said that faith is actually spelt R-I-S-K. And it is a risk, but it's based on the promises of God. Now, why did Joshua and the children of Israel have to have courage? Because there were giants. And there is always going to be opposition to what you are trying to do in the future, especially if you're doing it for God. Think about King David. He was a young shepherd boy in the field looking after his father's sheep, doing what he had been asked to do to the best of his ability, worshiping God, learning to relate to God and to overcome hardships. And suddenly, when he takes food to his brothers at the front line of the army, he sees this giant Goliath, and it's a fearful terrible spectacle that could have intimidated him and made him shrink within himself. But he had courage. He said, I'm not going to see the giant. I'm going to see the God of the armies of Israel. He says, who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine? I come against you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. He came with God's power and he saw the giant and he didn't min minimize it or pretend it wasn't there. He saw the giant in front of him but he saw the giant as an opportunity to step into the next level of what God had for him. He saw the giant as an opportunity for God to win a victory, for God to show himself great. And I want to say to you, my dear friend, there will be opposition, trouble, struggles and giants ahead of you. There always will be. We have throughout the Bible the promises that there will be opposition. But Jesus said, Take heart, I have overcome the world. Even though you will have tribulation, I have overcome. And with me, you can do it. God will lead us through these things, not around them. He doesn't take them out of our way. He leads us through them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. God will lead us through these battles. You know, the first time the Israelites got to the edge of the promised land, it was only Joshua and Caleb who said, we can take this land. Despite the giants, we can do it. But the majority of the population said, we can't. We look and feel like grasshoppers, they said. And we feel like they see us as grasshoppers. Interestingly enough, when Joshua and the Israelites eventually did go into the promised land, the inhabitants of Jericho told them that they had been fearful of the Israelites even those 40 years before. 
They had not seen them as grasshoppers. They had been fearful. But it's the attitude that we have when we're going into this next thing that causes us either to succeed or to fail. We need to say we are people of faith. We take God at his word. At the end of Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Do not throw away your confidence. God has no pleasure in someone who shrinks back. But we are those who step forward into the things God has for us. And we need to say, I am going to be bold and I'm going to take steps of faith. And then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves. So the next thing that we need to understand is that we're never in this alone. God never intended for you to be alone. You may say, I've got Jesus. I'm not alone. Yes, that's true. But God made you and I to be linked with other people. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, if two of you agree concerning anything, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And we need to get others to agree with us. When you're going into a new thing, if you would say to at least one other Christian, please, will you agree with me in prayer? Please, will you pray with me for this new thing? Please, will you stand on God's promises with me? And we at Leading Lights would love to do that. Send us an email and we will pray with you and stand with you for whatever the new thing is that you have in your life. But it is useful and important and imperative for us to be linked with other believers and to do it together. Joshua went throughout the camp and he said to all the people, get ready, let's get an agreement. Later on, they said, we are with you, Joshua. Just as we were with Moses, we will be with you. Only be strong and courageous. And that is the message that we should give. When somebody comes to us and says, please, will you stand with me in prayer and agreement for this new thing, this new thing that's ahead of me? We need to say yes, in faith, we believe God's promises. Not, oh, maybe, are you sure? Not be a negative person, but rather say we're standing, only be strong and courageous. If we're standing on God's promises, it's his power that we're relying on and not our own. And then he says, prepare provisions for yourselves. And this is my last point, is about being prepared in ourselves. Prepare yourselves. A couple of chapters later, in chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This was the day before they went in. He says, sanctify yourselves. Other versions of the Bible say, consecrate yourselves. Uh, In Psalms and Proverbs, it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That's Psalm 37 verse 5. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. And so I want to close with this thought of consecrating ourselves, preparing ourselves, committing ourselves and our plans to the Lord. And I just want to break it down into a few little points. When we commit or consecrate something to the Lord, there are different elements of it. There is an inward element where I'm preparing myself. Jesus told a parable about a man who was going to build a tower and he said, you must count the cost and make sure you're ready and you're going to see it through. There's a preparation within myself where I say, Lord, I'm I'm doing this and I'm going to stick at it and I'm not going to give up. I'm prepared. We also give it to the Lord and say, Lord, I commit this to you. You know, what's interesting is this word commit in Psalm 37 and Proverbs 16. Let me read these to you again. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way. Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts or your plans will be established. Commit your works, your way and your works, commit them to the Lord. But this word commit is a very interesting word. In these two verses, it is translated commit or give over to God. But in every other instance, there's 10 or 15 other places in the Old Testament that this word appears. And it is translated roll, roll, roll. But it's translated commit in these two verses. And every version of the Bible translates it commit. So it's correct to translate it commit. But the idea is this. You've got this big, perhaps log or or heavy thing at the top of a hill. And you have to roll it to the Lord. 
<laughs> commit it to the Lord, roll it to the Lord. But it takes a little bit of effort. You've got to get the momentum going. You need other people to agree with you and push with you. And you've got to push it in the right direction based on God's promises. But then you push and you push and then you roll it and then it's gone. Then it's rolling down the hill because you've committed it to the Lord. And I want to encourage you to do this with your future, but also with your past, to roll it onto the Lord. We told in the New Testament to roll our cares upon the Lord. Um, and I would encourage you to do this, to see it as something where you commit, you get others involved, you roll it onto God. And as long as you've done it in His way, the way that He wants us to do it, with His promises, with His people in faith and courage, and we roll it onto the Lord, then we stand back and we say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. And there's one just fascinating aspect to this. And that is that we can commit something to the Lord with first fruits. So Deuteronomy 26 verse 1 says, And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make His name abide. And they would give the first fruits. And there's this idea that God enabled the Israelites to take the best and the first of all their crops and all their produce, but also the firstborn animal from their livestock and their firstborn son. And at the start of every year, the, the first of their time as well, and, and commit it or consecrate it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm giving you a portion at the beginning. And God says, then I will bless the whole thing. Isn't that an amazing principle and an amazing gift from God? Now, when they gave it to the Lord, um, if it was grain, then it would be given to the temple. If it was an animal, it would be sacrificed. If it was a son, they would just dedicate him to the Lord. And if they couldn't actually give the beast or the grain or whatever, then they would give it in money. But there was this principle of being able to give the first and the best to the Lord, and then he blesses the whole thing. How are you doing with that? Because this is the last part of consecrating and giving over our new thing to the Lord. In Romans 11 and verse 16, it says, If the first fruit is, is holy, the whole lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. You know, Jesus is called the first fruits of all creation because he was the first to rise again. And we are called a type of first fruits, the Christians, because God has saved us and we represent the whole of our community and we can pray and intercede. And God has put this principle of first fruits in place. So I encourage you at the start of a week, go to church and commit it to the Lord. At the start of a day, pray and give it to the Lord. At the start of a month, commit it to the Lord and give him the first fruits of your salary. At the start of a year, dedicate the first to the Lord. And often we can give a first fruits offering as a way of showing God, Lord, I'm committing this to you. It doesn't have to be the whole thing. It's a portion. It's a, it's a picture. It's a symbol of our hearts being given to the Lord. But it's the best and the first. And so I'm going to encourage you at the start of whatever this new thing is that you're going into, for many of us, it's a new period, a new year, a new job, uh, a new relationship, whatever it is. Let's commit it to the Lord. Let's start by saying the old is dead. Moses is dead. Let's move on. Then we say, Lord, what are your promises for this thing? And then we gather other people in with us and we say we're going to be bold and courageous and we're going to fight through and we're going to commit this thing to the Lord and count the cost and consecrate it to him. Can I encourage you to decide now? You know, when the Spanish explorer Cortes landed on the shores of South America for the first time, he just crossed the Atlantic. It was a treacherous tri trip from Spain all the way across. But the first thing he did when he landed at the shore of the new land of South America was he burnt all his ships. He set fire to all of his boats. Why did he do that? Because he was saying, there's no going back. 
I'm burning my bridges and I'm moving ahead into this new thing. Can I encourage you to burn your bridges today and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to give away or give up or stop or turn away from? What can I change so that I'm going into this new thing with your blessing? Lord, we commit the future to you. We commit this next year to you and this next period to you. We commit this new thing to you. And Lord, we pray for your blessing, for your anointing, for your help. And we thank you, God, that your promises are with us, just as they were with Moses, that your courage and your strength courses through us as we look to you. And Lord, you put us with other people to be able to do great things for you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. For you are children of the light. Shine like stars in the dark world. You are the light of the world, like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Carry the light-giving message into the night. This is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the nations, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like stars forever. Leading Lights Network is here to help you grow as a disciple of Jesus and to help others become growing disciples. We have Bible school courses, weekly featured videos, testimonies from church leaders, and much, much more. We are also available to form relationships with you as you develop in God's plan and calling for your life. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com, link with us on social media, or download the Leading Lights app from any app store.